look at you and then you smile and wave and they run back to their dad and hug on. <laughs> Today's message follows the pattern that I've been on the series entitled Heavenly Minded. And we're to live a life preparing for heaven. We have a lifetime, a lifetime to make an eternal decision. I love that statement. We have an entire lifetime to make an eternal decision. And all of heaven is pulling for us. And I want to remind you before I get in this, begin reading scriptures, that you are more than you think you are. I believe one of the biggest regrets of heaven is when we get there and we realize what we were supposed to do and what has been invested into our being. I don't think most people understand or realize that they are powerful beings. That even in this sinful human form, we are capable of greatness. Not necessarily just by human standards, but by eternal standards. That there are people out there that need you. And that God is making appointments for you to keep. Appointments that you can literally change lives in by just making a few statements, by sharing a testimony, sharing a life experience with Christ, being bold enough to tell people what they need, to love them, to understand them, to be patient with them, and sometimes just to keep your mouth shut. And I really, really believe that when we die and we meet Christ, I'm trying my best on this earth to limit those disappointments by increasing my effectiveness for Christ and by me respecting God's creation. Respect your purpose. Protect your purpose. Don't be careless with it. Don't drag it through the mud and the trash. I remember sometimes I'd come home and um, I would have torn, torn my pants or got my shirt dirty, got grass stains on it because I rolled down the hill at school. And my mom would come and she'd see what I had done to the clothes that she had taken so much care for and buying. She'd say, honey, money does not grow on trees. And she would just scold me and, and say, I need you to respect your clothing. Your dad and I worked very hard for that. I think that when we meet Christ, we gonna, sometimes we drag our purpose. We drag it through three or four puddles. It's mired with mud and candy stains or what have you. Respect your life. Respect your purpose. There's a great calling. And there's a day coming, my friend, that the book of life is going to be opened. And we're going we're gonna to appear in this book, and things are going to be read to us. Things that we have said and actions that we have taken. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, 12, speaks of what happens here. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence. And there was no place for them, no place to hide. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and, and books were open. Yeah, there are books in heaven. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. It doesn't just say the righteous dead or the unrighteous dead, the dead. They were judged according to what was written in these books. I want to begin today's message by dropping a, a few bombs, okay? I'm going to make some, some very strong statements in the next few seconds. Number one, your Christian education is the most important education you will ever possess. Now, I want you to think about that. You might be a genius in physics, math, and philosophy. You might be a genius in linguistics and all other kind of tough subjects, uh, uh, biology and, and, and finances. But my friend, your Christian education is the most important education you will ever possess possess because it speaks to your eternal purpose, not your temporal purpose. Your Christian education is not 
temporal, it is eternal. Eternally, you cannot afford to do several things. Number one, you cannot afford to live the way you want. We've got to get that out of our head. It's my life. It's my life. You better rethink that. Eternally, you cannot afford to talk the way that you want. Eternally, you can't afford to act the way that you feel or that you want. We have a higher calling. We have a higher purpose. We are a higher created order. And we have the ability to go beyond our temporal feelings and to act as we really are, and that is supernatural. It's a high calling to be a human being, and much is expected to whom much is given. And you have been given God's breath of life. We are the only creature in the garden that the Lord God breathed into. We're the only one. And with that breath of God comes a great, great responsibility. And that responsibility will be realized either here or there. But when we see those books that are open and that book of life is open and it is recorded, our actions, our thoughts, our behaviors, we will absolutely give account to an eternal God because we are his eternal creation. Your actions and words have eternal effects and they have eternal consequences. Don't ever, ever forget that. And you will have an opportunity, some of you almost every day, to demonstrate that phrase that's on the screen right now. That everything that I think, everything that I say, I am a higher order being. And much is expected of me because I have been given the breath, the life of God himself. So I need to watch what I'm doing. The old-fashioned folks, the old fire-breathing, hell and brimstone preachers, they called it holiness. How many know what I'm talking about? To live a holy life. What does that mean? Holy life means a, a, just a, a good, clean life. No. To be holy means that you are called apart. Holy means set apart. Have you ever called something holy on your dinner plate? I look at my dinner plate and I assess what's there. Don't tell Rhonda. But I assess what's there and I'm looking around and I really like Lassure early peas. I like those. And if Lassure early peas, you know those little be tiny ones? I, I, I tend to save those for last. Some of you like mashed potatoes with a, a nice little dab of butter in there. You'll sort of hold on to those mashed potatoes. You don't eat them all at first. Because all that's left is Brussels sprouts and the other stuff that you don't like. But we tend to proportion our food. If you want to know what I like on the plate, watch me at dinner. Because I, I, I'm saving something for last. I don't know who makes it. And this is no disrespect to anybody else who makes stuff in potluck. But there's a dish, and I don't know who does it, but somebody makes this corn dish. It's sort of a, a mushy corn that has a sweet taste to it. And when I see that, I always get some of that and I pop it there. And watch me. It'll be the last thing I finish. Because I don't want that to go away. Why? Because it is holy to me. That means I have set it apart. It's special. I consider great value. I love everything else on the plate. But that right there, I think, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that apart because I enjoy that so much. And I just hope I'm not full by the time I get to it. A lot of people say, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to satisfy my, my, my hunger on that first, but this is me, I proportion. I do the same thing with a hot fudge sundae. You get that hot fudge sundae, you got the nuts, you got your hot fudge, you got your, your, your ice cream. You don't want to just eat all the hot fudge in three bites, do you? You want that hot fudge to last right to the last one. You have a perfect proportion of hot fudge and ice cream there. And some of you say, now I know why you're so big, Brother David. I get it. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. They're probably thinking, oh, I get it now. But you consider it special. So you set it apart. That's what God has done for you. He has all of creation, and all of creation is good. It's good. He created it. He loves it. He partakes in it. But you, he saves you. He moves you apart. and says, you know what, I'm just going to enjoy I'm going to enjoy her. 
I'm going to enjoy him. So in our lives, we have an opportunity to remain sweet, to remain palatable. It'd be terrible if I, I got into that, that nice corn dish or whatever it is, and, 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 and the creator of that dish put onions in it. Oh. And I, I, I lit into a piece of a raw onion. I just think, oh, no. Oh, no. I want it to be what I remembered it being. God created you sweet. He created you palatable. And when we live this life and we're reckless with our purpose, we put those raw onions, and sorry if you love raw onions, I just don't. But if we put that into our lives, and he partakes of us and goes, what happened? I want to be pleasing to God. I don't want to be a disappointment to him. I am holy. I am set apart. He's moved me to that position on his plate, and he's saving me for the best. That's your life. That's your purpose. And that's why you can't afford to say what you want to say. You can't afford to give other people what they deserve. You can't afford to just live however you want to because this is your life. You're special, my friend. You're better than you think you are. You're more important and you're more relevant than you realize. I begin to think of Brother Albert and Evelyn who have recently left us. What they're thinking, what they're seeing, what they're experiencing. Sitting under my ministry just recently and now they're with the Lord. Do you think that makes me nervous? You better believe that makes me nervous. Because now they're judging what I said. They're, they're testing it. Was he telling me the truth? Was he accurate? I must be accurate. I've got to be truthful. The last thing I want to be is a disappointment to anybody, much less the Lord my God. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35 to 37. <clears throat> a good man brings good things out of good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. We don't act good. We don't act evil. We're good or we're evil. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. My, my, my. King James says, every idle word men speak. That sentence and that phrase has haunted me a large part of my life. Has it ever haunted you sometimes? Where that you think, what am I doing? What am I saying? Especially when you're being an, a jerk. Or you're in the process of not being what God created you to be. That phrase whooshes through my mind. And I'm thinking, oh. Because sometimes temporarily, I forget who I am. <coughs> I have amnesia as to what my purpose is. And I'm tempted to do what I want say what I want and act the way I want and not the way I was created. Every idle word that men may speak. Someone is watching and someone is recording you. You are on the record 24-7. People like to say, can I say this off the record? There is no such thing as off the record. You are always on the record because you are a high created order. Do not ever believe the lie of the devil that says that, ah, you're just a regular person, you know, just a sinner saved by grace, just whatever, you know, Lord understands. You respect your purpose more than that. God has things that he needs for you to do. <clears throat> things that people are waiting for me to do. In my life, I experienced, I've experienced a lot of unprofessional behavior, sometimes between pastors or other people in communities where I have served as a pastor. I want to give an account of one situation where I was performing a duty as, as a pastor. And I came across someone that was in another profession, and they behaved unprofessionally toward me in the midst of my, my duty and my service. And I'm going to tell you right now, it made me mad. I got mad. I was indignant. You couldn't tell by looking at me, or maybe you could. I didn't say anything. I tried not to let the smile leave my face. But I was indignant. I told my wife, I said, smoke 
was coming out my ears. I bet the angels saw it. And I remember as I began to deal with that offense, I'm sort of just standing there, I'm thinking, and as time continued to go on, I began to rehearse what I was going to do. Anybody with me? I began to pretend what I was going to say. I was practicing like I practice. I don't practice preaching, but I was preparing. I was making a case. And I was very upset. And I felt justified in my feelings. Listen, the devil will always make sure you feel justified. Because what we all want is justice, right? Be careful how you answer that. The last thing you better desire is justice. We need to be lovers of mercy, not lovers of justice. My first response was, or my, my first thought was, I'm going to give this person a talking to. I'm going to, I'm going to have a, a meeting with them, and I'm just, I'm just going to let them know. What they did was wrong. What they said was wrong. And I don't ever want it to happen again. Can you tell us they're rehearsing? That was my first thought. The second thought that I had, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll up it a notch. Because if I approached that person, you know, I wouldn't have done what they did. So if they did it once, certainly they're capable of doing it again. So me just confronting them is just going to make them mad. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go to their superior. And I'll talk. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I will go to their superior. And I will tell them. Anybody ever thought about that one? I know how to stop this from happening again. I'll report them. Because they are, de they are deterring me from doing my Christian duty and my responsibility. And that's a way to keep it from ever happening again. Now, as I'm going through this, the Holy Spirit is listening and speaking. How many know what I'm talking about? He is speaking in my mind through scriptures and talking to me while I'm doing this. Now, I'm still mad, I'm still angry, but I'm dealing with an offense in the moment. One of the thoughts I thought of, well, I'm going to give him a chance to apologize. And boy, I didn't give much of a chance. My patience is worn thin. It didn't happen within an hour, and I was ready to take action. Here's the action that I took. I ate the offense. And I decided to show mercy. That's what I did. Because that's what Christ did for me. And what I did to Christ by the smallest sin that I would consider insignificant was greater than anybody could ever offend me. And you know what was really upset? It was pride. It was pride. I could eat that and have plenty of room for something else. And after all, I'm a higher created order. Amen? There is a purpose for my life. And I begin to recognize, now, I'm still mad and I was still upset. But faith began to teach me. If faith began to say, David, it's in these moments right now that determines the men from the boys. You just need to eat this and go on. You're big enough, you're old enough, you've had enough experience. This would be an insult to God's grace and mercy and your calling for you to continue in this because all you're trying to satisfy is your personal pride. Now, you may look at me and say, what has he got to be proud about? I've noticed that no matter what people look like and no matter how untalented they are, everybody has pride. You know what I mean? It's not just the Hollywood model types and the people that have all the gifts in all of academics and everything that have pride, my friend. I've seen the dumbest people look like they were, they were hit with an ugly stick have pride. I have. Pride is no respecter of intellect, skill, or talent. It hits us all. And I thought, it's just my pride that's offended. I've got enough grace and mercy that's been given to me to spend it on this. And I decided to eat it. And it is a daily meal. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Because the enemy doesn't just give up that one time that you overcome. He comes back and says, yeah, you remember that? Remember that? 
give it, let them them have it. Pull out both barrels. After all, they deserve it. And you know what? You're going to prevent that from happening to somebody else. So it's a loving action. No, it's not. It's not at all. It's never a loving action to touch someone else's security and to affect their family with your words. Of course, today there's still been no apology. And there is none expected. Is that weakness on my part to eat the offense? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. How many of you want mercy today? How many of you need mercy today? Yeah? Well, if you want to receive mercy, if you want to hold on to mercy, in those moments, you need to be willing to realize your higher order that you belong to Christ and you are his ambassador, an ambassador of heaven. And in those moments, we need to give mercy. Because Christians should never be lovers of justice. Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. I'm almost done. This is another scripture that runs through my mind in moments like this. It would benefit you to remember this. If it is possible... And as far as it depends on you, I want you to remember something. You are high creation. You are a high, the highest order of creation. And you are fashioned with God's hands and breathed into of his being. Your potential is limitless. You are a powerful person and force in this universe. You can handle this. As far as it depends on you, that's a long way, high created order. Live at peace with everyone. Can I add the DJ part? I didn't put this in there. Even the jerks. Live at peace with everyone. And the jerks will test you. And you know what? You begin to think about those people that say ugly things and act ugly and do bad things. God bless their hearts. Because there's a very good chance that they were treated that same way. There's a very good chance that they were not as fortunate as you were. And that they weren't given as much grace as you have in having good mom and dad or good a good rearing. There's a very good chance that there's a lot of reasons that they're the way they are. So there comes a time where you just take that fork out. And this isn't that really nice, this isn't that corn thing. These are the raw onions. You've got to eat them. You've got to eat them. This is advanced Christianity. The other night at the the Christian Sisters Lady Salad Supper, Officer BJ told us to be aware of our surroundings. She said to be careful. Always have your eyes open and be aware of any situation. Look for danger spots. Look for any potential danger spot that your your life could be in. Be very aware of your words, the Bible tells us. Be aware, very aware of your actions, Scripture instructs us. Keep your eyes open and realize that every single day you are in danger of losing a part of your purpose and sacrificing it and dragging it through the mud puddles on your way home. Your words, your actions, your thoughts, and your feelings, they count because they are being recorded. You say, well, whoa, that just really makes me nervous. What am I supposed to do to that? Put them under the blood. There's time for you right now, friend. You're still in the process of that eternal decision to say, Lord, I am so sorry. Please forgive me for my actions in this situation. Please forgive me for giving place and giving way to my pride and allowing it to decide and identify myself. God, forgive me and help me. Give me the grace to behave as a high created order because I know I can because you fashioned me and I can pull this off. Everything you say will be recorded and it will count. I encourage you this morning as God's highest creative order to do your very, very best to live a life worthy 
of your holiness. Because God has taken you on his plate and he's put you right here because he wants to save you. And you know what? He saved me. He saved you. He gave his life for you and me. Sacrificed greatness for us. So there must be greatness in us. Bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, I pray for my brother, my sisters, they're out here today. Help us to not believe the propaganda that we aren't that special, that we're not that important, that we're just average. Help us, Father, to see over, above, and beyond the insult that is average. And help us, Lord God, to live a life that is continually chasing you and following our purposes, Lord. As Paul said, not that I have not that I have, have completed, but I apprehend, I pursue the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, we're chasers, and we're going to chase you all the way to the grave. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your power. Most of all, I thank you for your voice in my heart and in my life. Thank you, Father, for continually speaking to me and my beloved brothers and sisters here today. In Jesus' name, if you agree, congregation, say amen. Amen. Stand with me, please, and let's sing to